previously we discussed, the seclusion of Zainul Abidin resulted in the Shia aligning themselves to other movements and inevitably wandering into the realm of conjecture. The Kaysaniyya were the pioneers of this thought process, but it would no longer be restricted to them only. The stage having been set, the era of Imam Baqir saw a number of new theories being introduced into the Shi'i world. Amongst the Kaysaniyya were those who believed that leadership had passed on to his son, Abdullah ibn Muhammad, known as Abu Hashim. They were called the Hashimiyya. Upon the death of Abu Hashim, again they became divided, as they did on the demise of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, and four theories emerged. Abu Hashim has died, and his brother Ali is the Imam and his successor. Abdullah ibn Muawiyah ibn Abdullah ibn Ja'far is the Imam and his successor. This group became known as the Harithiyya because Abdullah ibn Harith promoted it. Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Abdullah ibn Abbas is the Imam and his successor. They became known as the Rawandiyya. Abu Hashim is the promised Mahdi. These were the followers of Bayan and Nahdi and were thus dubbed as Bayaniyya. Bayan al-Nahdi later claimed to be a Nabi and even wrote to Imam Baqir, forewarning him not to deny his prophethood. The Shia who ascribed to each of these sects would become further subdivided, their followers either claiming them to be the Mahdi in occultation, believing in succession of the sun, or bestowing upon them divinity and claiming prophethood for themselves. And Nawbakhti writes in detail about the formation of these sects within the Shia and also documents the extremist beliefs which had not existed previously. It is ironic, however, that many of those beliefs which he deemed extremist became part and parcel of present-day Twelver Shiism. The underlying reason for this assimilation into mainstream Shiism is that the deviants and founders of these subsects make up the core of the Twelver Shi'i tradition. While the bulk of the Shia were justifying the leadership for Ali ibn Muhammad al Hanafiya, Abdullah ibn Muawiyah, Muhammad ibn Ali al Abbasi, or for the claim that Abu Hashim is the Mahdi, a minority group posited another theory that Muhammad al Baqir was the Imam after Zainul Abidin. The advocates of this view attempted to consolidate the Imama for Al-Baqir using the argument of possessing the weapon of the Prophet And so, another theory emerged. Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Safar reports from Al-Baqir, The position of the weapon to us is similar to the Ark of Bani Israel. Wherever it is found, that will be where leadership will be. So wherever the weapon is found, that is where knowledge is. Even at this point, there is no mention of divine appointment, but rather, entitlement is being argued on the basis of possessing the sword of the Prophet ﷺ. However, the adherents of this view were very small in number. The majority of the Shia, either following Zayd or Abu Hashim, Sayyid Hussein Jafri writes in The Origins and the Early Development of Shia Islam. The fact remains unchallenged that after Hussein's death, the majority of the Shi'is followed Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya and not Zain al Abidin. Though the Tawabun, as we have seen, thought of the latter as their prospective Imam, even the remnants of the Tawabun who survived the Battle of Ain al Warda were attracted by Mukhtar to the side of Ibn al Hanafiya. He continues. Thus, the Mahdiism of Ibn al Hanafiya soon became the order of the day among the Shi'i of Kufa, and in course of time, the idea was popularly spread and accepted by the people, and developed its own doctrines and dogma, legends and beliefs. The majority of the Shia, thus in that particular period, became the followers of the Mahdi Imam, attached to the person of Ibn al Hanafiya, and eclipsed though only for a short period of time, the Imams from the line of Hussein. The perverts of this movement used the possession of the Prophet's sword as proof against the Kaysaniyya and its subsects of the Harithiyya, Rawandiyya, Bayaniyya and the Zaydiyya, who claimed the Imama for Zayd, the brother of Imam Baqir, and even against the Hassanid who would later rebel against the Abbasids. 
it is alleged that Imam Baqir said, while addressing his rival claimants from the Ahlul Bayt, Can they say with whom is the weapon of the Prophet of Allah? The sign that was on his sword was also on his two sides, if they but know. A legend was soon brought into circulation of Ali Zainul Abidin summoning Al-Baqir and officially passing the torch to him, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Safar, one of the leading Shi'i scholars of the 3rd century, used to say, Ali ibn Hussein preferred his son, Muhammad al-Baqir, at the time of his death, with possessing the shield that contained the weapon of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Using this argument against the Zaydis, the followers of Zayd ibn Ali, the Shia created an image of jealousy and rivalry between the members of the Ahlul Bayt, as Safar reports. His brothers challenged him on it, and he said to them, By Allah, you have no right to it. If you had any right, he would not have given it to me. The Shia were willing to portray the Ahlul Bayt as people constantly complaining, bickering and vying with one another for power. Uncle is depicted to be against nephew, cousin against cousin, and even brother against brother, each uttering unfathomable condemnation for the other. The reputation of the Ahlul Bayt was readily sacrificed, but not the false notions they ascribed to them. The observant would have noticed the Shi'i doctrine of Imama slowly starting to take shape but it is still far from crystallization. If the Twelfth doctrine of Imama truly existed and was transmitted by the Prophet ﷺ and his companions from the Ahlul Bayt, then surely textual evidence would be the weightiest proof against those who oppose this divine line. Even more surprising is that the so-called rival claimants are no longer the likes of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman or even Muawiyah who are deemed the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt and avidly cursed. But now, the enemy has become those very individuals who share the blood of the Prophet ﷺ and form part of his Ahlul Bayt. If leadership had been declared for these 12 Imams, why did their own Ahlul Bayt not hold true to this declaration? Why did their partisans not testify to their Imama, but rather differed with each other concerning this? The attitudes of the Shia and their irreconcilable differences reveal a conflicting portrait of Shiism when compared to the sketch of present-day Shi'i literature and the haughty proclamations of Shi'i Da'is. Keenly observe in Shi'i Islam, a beginner's guide. The story told in 12 Shi'i history books of an oddly succession of 12 Imams each with a large following and believing the same doctrines as present-day Twelver Shiris, is largely a backward projection of the final stage, the past reconstructed in the image of the norms of the present. Insofar as we can reconstruct the past, it was probably very different and much more complex than the simple picture told by the later Shia historians.